Rolling. And we're ready. Hello, my name is Sidney Porter, and I'm pleased on behalf of the Health Physics Society History Committee to interview Al Checky. Al has been a member, uh, he is a charter member of one of the few charter members of the Health Physics Society, and is a person that has had a career of giving service to the society, and also being a person that has accomplished a huge amount in uh, many areas of health physics, but I think probably your work with standards, both early and middle and late career, are probably among your largest contributions. And I think also of you as sort of a gadfly, and when you see something is wrong, mm -hmm. you speak up and you say, this isn't right, it should be corrected. You're not always popular for that, but you get attention to the topic. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's a person that gets things accomplished. And the society needs people that, that A, are gadflies, and B, draw attention to things that, uh, that need work. Now, Al started out uh, many years ago uh, not at all in, in health physics. You want to tell me a little bit about why uh, your earliest um, interest in science, Al? Well, the thing that got me, really got me started was science fiction. When I was about eight or ten, I started reading science fiction, and that must have been in the uh, late 30s, early 40s, and there were some science fiction stories about nuclear reactors, even in those days when everything was secret. And I thought, this is interesting, exciting, it's a big power source, it has all kinds of benefits for people, and maybe that's the kind of thing I ought to devote my life to. The thing that I started out doing in my life, however, was chemistry. And I did that because, for some reason, and I still don't know why, when I was eight or nine, I got a chemistry set, and I loved it. And I also liked to cook, which is part chemistry. So I started out with, with having the idea of being a chemist, and always with the idea of going to college. And I took courses in high school that were aimed at going to college. My mother was registrar of Wayne State, so I got a lot of uh, information about colleges. And she thought that I should go to a small college first, liberal arts, to get a feel for what little colleges are like, and then I should go to MIT. Well, I wanted to be a concert pianist. And I kind of struggled a little bit, but you know, dollars count. So I said, to dad and mom, all right, you give me the money to go to MIT, I'll still play the piano and I'll have both. And I still play the piano to, to today. But I went to MIT with the idea of becoming a chemist and yeah. also with the idea of doing something in the nuclear field, even in those days. I took all of the courses I could take at MIT with respect to atomic physics and nuclear physics and nuclear chemistry. And I got my degree in nuclear chemistry after working for uh, some thesis advisors called Coriel and Irvine. And they wrote the book on nuclear chemistry. I had to do a thesis even as an undergraduate at MIT. Yeah. And one of the things that I remember was looking for chromium-59, which was the, the purpose of the thesis. and having my first <coughs> brush with health physics. Mm. Well, this is cyclotron produced, correct? Yeah, we had to take the uh, piece of iron over to the cyclotron, irradiate it, put it in a little pig about 55 pounds, and I remember running with my arm out like this to keep the pig away from me. No measurements, no health physics, no film badge, nothing. And I, so I don't know what the dose rate was, but I suppose we could go back and calculate it again. Running down the, the uh, hall to the chemistry room from the cyclotron so I could do the chemistry because it was supposed to have a short half-life. That was my first brush with health physics. Now, did you ever actually find any chromium-56? No, our, uh, it was the half-life was too short and it took me too long to run down the, the hall to do the chemistry. Did you finally understand that? Oh, yes. I couldn't run any faster, though. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you also understood the power of negative information, too, then. Oh, sure. At an early age. Yep. And it was a little disappointing, but it was, 
any kind of information is good. doesn't matter whether yes, you absolutely. find it or you don't find it. As a matter of fact, some of the things you don't find are as important as the things you do find. Absolutely. And, and people who don't publish negative findings, I think, make a mistake. They should publish the negative findings. It'll keep other people from coming behind them and trying to find, find out the same thing and wasting time and wasting money. And in this day of litigation, it's so important to have negative information Absolutely. as well as positive information. Absolutely. Well, after, uh, after you got your uh, degree, uh, or actually while getting your degree, you were in the Navy for a while, right? Yeah. At that particular time in the 50s, the Korean War was going on, and there was a question about whether I was going to get a deferment or not. So I decided to enlist because I wanted to go in the Navy, so I'd always have a bed. In the Army or the Marine Corps, you're never sure if, where you're going to sleep at night. <laughs> but if you're on a ship, you usually have some place to sleep. So I went in the Navy, besides which I've sailed all my life, and I love the ocean, I love the sea. And I spent four very useful years in the Navy. I learned uh, electronics uh, uh, a lot, like a four-year college course crammed into nine months, which stood me in good stead later on. Um, I worked for a year at White Sands on rockets, which got me interested in uh, missiles. Uh, I spent a year in the Med and a year going around the world. So those four years were very well spent. Then I went back to MIT, finished my degree, and during that period of time, which was only six, one semester, six months. What year was that? That was 56, mm -hmm. 55, 56. Um, I was looking at hydrogen peroxide with respect to use in missiles. Mm -hmm. So I did two theses at MIT, one in nuclear, uh, nuclear chemistry and one in uh, missile chemistry, and then went to work at Sandia Corporation uh, in high-level dosimetry for radiation effects to materials. So that sort of got me into dosimetry, which is part of health physics. Now, were you, uh, what were you using as dosimeters then? Uh, we were, well, <laughs> we were looking Ferric. for a dosimeter mm -hmm. that would measure megarads. Ferric oxide, you get the ferrous? We looked at that. It didn't look like it would go far enough. We were looking at organic uh, methods, glass, anything we could find that would go up to 10 to the 8th, yeah. 10 well, to the 9th. Well, the Army had glass, this old glass dosimeters, remember them. Yeah, and we were working toward adapting them for uh, very high level dosimet dosimetry work. Um, at that time, I got interested in the standards business, particularly with respect to ASTM and N13, not necessarily the Health Physics Standards Committee, although that was ancillary, uh, because tho those were the places where people knew about dosimetry, health physics. Let me back up a minute. In 1956, you became a charter member of the Health Physics Society. Now, tell me about that. How did that happen? Well, that happened, again, because of the dosimetry. Sandia said, go find out who the people are who know about dosimetry. And they were the health physics people. And most of them were Los Alamos and, uh, and Oak Ridge at the time. Most of them were Oak Ridge, actually. And I got interested in the dosimetry part of health physics, so I decided to join these people who were in this new field of health physics at that time because of the emphasis on dosimetry. Bobby, who, uh, do, you, do you remember any of the dosimetrists that you work with at uh, Los Alamos? Uh, Joe oh Sag, did my. you know Joe when he was there? Oh, I knew Joe Sag, sure. Because he was with EG&G, &G, then he was at Los Alamos, then at yep. Oak Ridge. Um, I'm trying to think of the, uh, Jerry Dumfer, Dumfy, Dumfer, Jerry, Maybe Dummer. Jerry oh. Dummer was at Los Alamos. And he was another one that I worked with in the early days. Um, that dosimetry information sort of percolated in my head. And when a job came avail became available at the Nevada test site as dosimetry supervisor, I thought, well, let's go there and, and look at the other part of the dosimetry. That was about 1958? Spectrum. That was about 1958. So, so I what did that job entail? That job entailed processing a lot of dosimeters. <laughs> I think I must have, my, with these hands, processed a half a million film badges. Now, did you, was there any thought of measuring beta in those days, or was it all photons? It was all gamma. It was all gamma. Um, 
we had a filter over the film that filtered out the betas, and we just read the density under that filter. That was, that was it. I also did some work on plutonium bioassay uh, measurements, and we developed a technique for increasing the sensitivity of de detecting plutonium in urine there. So that was, and that was published in the journal. Health Physics Journal. Yeah. So it, it was kind of getting into health physics from the dosimetry and, and bioassay standpoint, not from the radiological engineering standpoint yet. Then I went to R.S. Landauer Jr. and company and became his manager for the film badges in the West Coast. And were you actually developing them there? Or were they all no, I had, I had somebody doing it for me. I was the manager for the office. But at that particular time, uh, Landauer had some technical difficulties that I was able to solve because of my knowledge from uh, the test site. And we improved his film badge system significantly. Uh, By the way, while you were at the test site, you were still using the uh, DuPont film? DuPont film, two, two pieces of film. Right, the, the, the sensitive and insensitive yep. uh, emulsions. And then, and did you ever switch over to uh, Kodak, or did you stay with DuPont no, the whole time? No, we had DuPont the whole time. Because DuPont eventually went out of business, and everybody yeah. had to switch. So that was yeah. after that. That was after, after okay. my time. I was, I was feeling a little hemmed in, a little narrow in my career choice, and when a job opening at U.S. Nuclear came along to uh, literally be a salesman for labeled compounds, I uh, left Landauer and went to U.S. Nuclear in Burbank. And while I was there, it became apparent <clears throat> that they needed a radiation safety officer. And by that time, I had learned quite a bit about health physics, but it was all on the job training. There were no courses. You couldn't go to school for health physics. So all my health physics training, well, not all of it, but most of it, has been on the job. At U.S. Nuclear, they made sources, shields, handling equipment, uh, labeled compounds. So the RSO had to know about health physics for everything from tritium to... Uh, we had some plutonium beryllium sources, not unsealed on purpose uh, <laughs> for a while. I, I could tell you stories about that. Especially but I, the radium beryllium ones tend to leak after a while. Yes. Uh, so you had to know the whole gamut about health physics. That's where I got involved in health physics, really, the broad subject of health physics for the first time. And what year was that? And that was uh, 60, 1960. And Al Goldstein was the manager of U.S. Nuclear at the time. He had also gone to MIT. He was extremely knowledgeable about things nuclear. And at that particular time in the 60s, there was no thought of Alara. I mean, not in the formal sense that we have it today. If you could do something to keep the dose down, you did it if it didn't cost a whole lot. But we worked to the limit. Three rem per year, used up the bank, uh, there was no thought of 5 rem per year or 2 rem per year. It was 12 rem per year if you had a bank, and if you didn't have a bank, it was a rem and a quarter per quarter. And we had an 18-year-old who came to work for us, and of course he had no bank, and we had a dickens of a time keeping his annual dose below 5 rem. <laughs> because in a small company, in those days, only regulated by the then AEC back in Washington, although they had a field office in California, um, you, and you didn't have a lot of money, dose was worth dollars. And we used up every single millirem of every single worker we had every single year. So the philosophy of health physics in those days, in my experience, is totally different than it is now. Well, at U.S. Nuclear, as I say, we used up everybody's dose, so the, the, uh, the work of making radioactive sources uh -huh. was as involved with, with dose as it was with money. And 
we had to plan our doses very, very carefully. I remember loading a 10,000 um, Curie Cobalt 60 irradiator that was about six feet tall. Uh, by pulling the sources out of the top of the hot cell, dropping them in a V-shaped grooved uh, funnel s slider and having them just fall down into the into the shield and we had to build some shielding around this slider well we all had uh, pocket dosimeters on and after we had loaded a couple of these probably 2000 Curie cobalt 60 sources with enormous dose rates of course above the uh, above the system but nothing down where we were I looked at my dosimeter and it had 500 millirem on it. It was only supposed to have had 10. And we stopped immediately and looked at the shielding and we left one brick out that made a direct line from the source to me. Mm. The other people's dosimeters were down where they should have been. So I learned very quickly the importance of being very sure that all the shielding is in place for, a, for an experiment or a process if you're going to do it. So we put the brick in, then we finished, and it was no, no problem. But at U.S. Nuclear, I learned a lot about very, very practical health physics. We had a glove box for making uh, <coughs> polonium beryllium sources, a wooden glove box with wooden. With wooden Glove Strange. box. Well, it's cheap. Stainless steel is expensive. Remember, I said we didn't have a lot of money. And in those days, uh, we didn't. <laughs> so we had wooden glove boxes, and there was a, a turntable for the welding machine so that you could weld the capsules closed that went through the bottom of the glove box through uh, a, a gasket. After a while, the gasket wore out, and one night um, I got called at home, being the RSO. The fellow who was making these uh, POB sources had checked himself out, and he found he was contaminated. So I came over, and we started looking for where the contamination came from, and it was gross all over the room. The problem was, when he was moving the gloves in and out of the glove boxes, the, the uh, gasket around the rotating uh, rod had worn out and the polonium was all going out the bottom of the glove box and was all over the room. Mm. And we had an incredible mess. But fortunately it was contained in the room and uh, we could clean it up. But I remember... Anybody burdened for him? Uh, yeah, we had, yeah, and that was an interesting health physics job. That was my first internal dosimetry uh, calculation. We had to cl calculate the dose to his spleen. And it turned out that it wasn't above the regulatory limits. We had to report it because the air concentrations were too high. There, then you were limited to 40 uh, MPC, MPC hours, hours yeah. uh, a week. And of course, it was way above that. Anyhow, uh, that turned out OK. But I can remember myself going back into that room, spraying the glove box with Krylon inside and out so that we could fix the polonium that was left and throw it away. I was in a Scott air pack, and it was hot. But it, I got a lot of real practical health physics experience at U.S. Nuclear. And then I thought, well, I'm working for this small company. I really want to work for a bigger company. And Atomics International was in Canoga Park, and they had reactors and a big hot lab, and uh, they had the sodium graphite reactor, which was interesting. They had snap reactors, space reactors, which were interesting. So I went to work for them for a while and uh, learned a lot about reactor health physics and mm -hmm. things like that, and, and bigger hot labs. And we eventually even designed a plutonium fuel fabrication plant. Mm -hmm. So I got information about plutonium. And so between U.S. Nuclear and Atomics International, I got very, very knowledgeable about all kinds of health physics things, including regulatory things. And all during this time, of course, I was interested in standards. Now, when did you really start into standards, per se? About 1964, about the time we, I went to work for Atomics International, uh, because they were interested in standards. 
Uh, Bob Alexander, well, Bill Fisher and was first, and, but then Bob Alexander were, were my immediate supervisors. And they were very supportive of standards work because they understood that if you are f intimately involved with developing a standard, first of all, you get to meet other people in the field and you can get cross-pollinated with information. But secondly, because you have to be technically correct, it forces you to go learn things that you might not otherwise have learned. So support of standards has a, a lot of benefit for any particular company that's involved in it. And they knew that. And so they were willing to support standards work. There were other people besides me that were involved in it. But I got uh, onto the HPS Standards Committee about 64 for about six years. And you were working for Alexander then? And I was working for either Bill Fisher or Alexander, I don't remember which. I think it was Bill first, and then Bob. But Bob was one of my, if you want to call it, uh, mentors in health physics. He had a, a mind like a steel trap, and he wanted everything to be absolutely technically perfect. So all of the documents that we created while I was working for him I thought were probably the best set of radiological engineering documents that I've ever seen in the whole world. Mm. He, was, he was just absolutely marvelous. Um, so I learned a lot about how to be precise in health physics mm -hmm. from him. I had learned a lot about practical health physics from Alan Goldstein, who was the manager of U.S. Nuclear. So those two guys were really, after my thesis advisors, Coriel and Irvine, were the two people that I, I would say had a lot of influence on my career in health physics. Tell me more about the standards. You, you, you started in uh, around, around 56 or so, 64 or so. And, uh, with health physics. With health physics. And, and how did that work with standards progress? Well, I was on the standards committee. I was also on the writing groups. And while we were... Uh, while I was working at U.S. Nuclear, I joined the local Northern California chapter of the Health Physics Society, Southern California chapter of the Health Physics Society, and we had a problem with permissible levels of contamination on items released to uncontrolled use. Um, there was a license condition yeah. that the that was imposed on licensees, which was fairly precise, but it was based on instrument detection capability. And we thought about 1964 in the local Health Physics Society chapter, Standards Committee, they had one, hmm. that we should That's develop. That's unusual, by the way. Yes, but we started one, and we thought we should develop that standard. So er, N1312, which was issued a year or two ago, started in 1964 in wow. the Southern California chapter of the Health Physics Society Standards Committee. And Bobby, was that, um, did you form that standards committee? Where did that standards committee come from? Yeah, was it always I, no, well, you I, I started it, it and uh, Charlie Willis and I started the uh, standard on contamination for on items released to uncontrolled use. Uh, it took a long time to get it out, but Bill Kennedy finally chaired the writing group that issued N1312 uh, mm. a couple of years ago. So. People who write standards sometimes take a long time to get them developed, but we got, we got them developed. Another standard that I started was the uranium bioassay standard when I was at Atomics International. Um, we, we had some idea of what amount of uranium there should be in urine excreted from people who had inhaled uranium, but it wasn't really based on very good science. So I said, we need a standard on bioassay for uranium. I got all of the fuel fabrication people in the country together and started what turned out to be finally issued as the uranium bioassay standard a few years ago, which also took about 30 years to develop. So, well, that's a tough one. There isn't much data. Well, there, there wasn't a whole lot. And it turned out that the commercial people in the United States all had their own ways of doing things. So one of the things that we wanted to do with the standard is to get a uniform system for the whole country mm -hmm. for bioassay, which we did.
finally. Um, why, why does it take so long? In other words, what you're telling me is that from, the, from you know, 30 years ago, you started out knowing there was a need for the standard. Mm -hmm. And it actually took 30 years before the standard came to fruition and it could be published. I would say that the, the reason it took so long was because we had the wrong working group, writing group chairman. The writing group chairman are the key to getting the standard issued. And if they don't ride herd on their people and get the, and have, you know, really are committed to getting the standard done mm -hmm. by the date you say, it languishes. Now, part of the, the difficulty is when you're doing voluntary standards work, that's ancillary to your job, and sometimes you change position, and you don't tell the, the standards uh, people that you're now not working in this area anymore, and for a year or two, nothing happens, and then you get another writing group started, and it, it has to do with people, and it has to do with the fact that the standards organization needs to make sure that the standards that are being developed are really being developed on a timetable, and if you have to fire the working group chair, you fire the working group chair. I've done that three or four times. Don't imagine that's always so easy. Actually, it's not hard. <laughs> it's not hard at all. Uh, all they're usually very reasonable people, and they understand the problem, and they say, gee, I'm sorry, I didn't we really get this done in time, and maybe you need somebody else. When you, uh, I don't want to say confront them with it, but when you bring the subject up, and they're perfectly willing to let it go and have somebody else come along and, and take it mm. over. But the, but the people who run the standards business have got to understand that that has to happen, or it takes 30 years to develop a standard. Oh, I had no idea that, that you know, you had been working on that one standard so long. It's, it's, it's well, I wasn't associated with it during all of that period. I realize period. that, but the point is that you, 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 you saw the need for it mm -hmm. early on, and there was some work on it, mm -hmm. and then it languished for many years before it actually came out. Yep. There was one work writing group person for that, a chairman for that standard, that let it sit for about 10 years and didn't do anything. Mm. Wow, that's hard to believe. Well, let, let's go on with your uh, career. Uh, okay. In the middle 60s, uh, uh, you um, finally left uh, uh, Burbank, U.S. Nuclear. Mm -hmm. And I went to Atomics International. AI. And uh, as I said, I learned quite a bit about right. reactor and then, safety. And then you left AI. And went to General Electric. GE. Now tell me about your GE job. You were there for a lot of years. I was there for 17 years. I started out as the administrator for the GE licenses at San Jose. Um, I then got involved with, well, and I was continuing the standards work, so I was coordinating all of GE's nuclear standards activities at the San Jose site. And they were quite extensive. They must have had, I don't know, 100 or maybe even 200 of their engineers that were involved in standards work. Mm. And so I had to keep, keep track of who those were and how many hours they spent and which committees they were on. It was a big job um, while keeping on with my own health physics standards. Then I went to uh, work for the reactor design group on the BWR Mark III containment and our concern was if the reactor had a, a large break accident, the steam would go out, go into a, a uh, suppression Internet, pool, yeah. and then the radionuclides would come up in the air. Now, what happens to the people who are in there at the time? And so from the health physics standpoint is, uh, was, how do you determine what kind of dose they get and how much time they have to get out? And that was kind of an interesting health physics problem. And it was fun because later on, I went back to I went to Switzerland to do some work yeah. for the Muhlberg reactor, and Leibstadt had been built at the time, and I saw my own work come back because Leibstadt was a was a BWR Mark III containment reactor. I saw my own work coming back mm. in the design of that wow. reactor, which was kind of fun. So I stayed at, at GE until they. Well, during the time they moved their fuel fabrication plant from San Jose to Wilmington, North Carolina. Mm. So when that went away, a lot of the radioactive work at San Jose left. And I became uh, 
manager for all of nuclear safety, which included criticality safety as well. So I got involved with criticality mm -hmm. safety. Um, I worked then as an auditor, f internal auditor for GE for its facilities around the world. So I got to go to Japan, for example, and audit the JNF fuel fabrication plant in Japan. Hmm. And it's in Japan where I learned <coughs> that when you're talking to a Japanese and you ask them a question and they say yes, that doesn't mean they agree with you. That just means they understand what you said. And if you want agreement, you have to wait till the second yes, or maybe the no. But learning different um, customs. Uh, customs and societies was fascinating at GE. I had to go to Italy and do the same thing. I went to Switzerland and did mm. the same thing. So I got my education was greatly increased while I was working for GE, not necessarily in the health physics arena, but in health physics, you have to be able to talk to all kinds of people. Absolutely. And so that generalist. helped a lot. So, so um, after all these years at, at GE, you finally uh, decided to leave there. Well, Neutron Jack came along, Jack Welch, as chairman of GE, and he said, cut out everything that you don't need to make the bottom line be the best it can. So they decided they didn't need internal auditors anymore. And also, they really weren't awfully interested in building nuclear power plants anymore. Part of my career has spanned the beginning of nuclear power in the United States, its ascendancy, and its precipitous Decline. decline. Yes. Well, right about the time it declined, I left because there really wasn't a whole lot to do And that anymore. was around 78? No, that was 86. Oh, it really started with the TMI accident it actually started the decline. That was, e because yeah. Because there that were no more major contracts given out after that. No. And I have been extremely involved with the anti-nuclear movement in the country as an extracurricular activity. Tell me about that. Well, in 1968 is when it really started. There was a fellow by the name of Tsivoglu who wrote a paper on, I think it was the Millstone, what's the other reactor that begins with M in Minnesota? Uh, Monticello. Monticello reactor on the fact that its effluent levels would, if you believe the linear hypothesis, create thousands of cancers in the people surrounding the, the plant. And I critiqued that paper by Tsivoglu for the Health Physics Society, showing how he had selected data and extrapolated and come really to the wrong conclusions. There, but that was when the anti-nuclear people really got started. There was an organization in Palo Alto called Creative Initiative Foundation that started in the 30s as a self-help mental group for people in the area. And they did a lot of good. Yeah. Amelia Rathbun and her husband and her son ran the organization. Probably 3,000 GE engineers belonged to it. Wow, really? That's yeah. Uh, but in 1973 or maybe 72, that foundation looked at the social <laughs> structure of the country and th they said, we don't like the political, economic, and social structure, and we want to change it. Wow. <laughs> and they said, how do you change it? Well, what is it that gives people the ability to do the kinds of things that we do in this country? Energy. Each one of us has about 300 energy slaves working for <coughs> us every day. Well, if you remember the old days, when they had kings and queens, they had a lot of slaves. So the kings and queens lived well. Slaves didn't. We have energy slaves working for us these days that let us do all of the kinds of things that we do now. And they said, we want to take those slaves away from people. So they have to go back to work. So they're not going to ruin the, the planet. They're not going to tramp through our beautiful Yosemite National Park and dig trail holes along Tuolumne Meadows. These are the Creative Initiative Foundation. They're not stupid. They are lawyers and doctors and engineers, and they have an agenda. 
and the agenda is to get fewer people on the planet so that we don't destroy the planet. Well, how, you, how do you do that? Yeah. There was, in 1964, during the plenary session, there was a professor from somewhere, and I've forgotten where, that drew a curve uh, on the blackboard showing the population as a function of the energy sources that were available at the time. Every time we got a new energy source, the population went up. And you could see it go up with coal. You could see it go up with oil. And it's going up now, not necessarily because we have nuclear, but in part because we do. So they said, how are we going to stop these, this population from doing all this? Cut off its energy. Which energy source do we attack? Nuclear because we can create fear. Have you read the book Nuclear Fear? No. There is a book called Nuclear Fear, which chronicles a lot of why people are afraid of things nuclear. Well, Creative Initiative said, got to get rid of nuclear. And all of our members have to say nuclear power is bad. At which point, all but three GE, nuclear, uh, GE engineers quit <coughs> Creative Initiative Foundation. Breidenbaugh, Hubbard, and Minard stayed for about six months, and to the fanfare and glare of TV cameras, they left GE saying how bad GE reactors were. Mm. So Creative Initiative has been really the director of the anti-nuclear movement in the United States all these years, since mm. about 1972 or three. Um, we have, of course, NRDC, the uh, Nuclear Defense Council, a uh, bunch of re lawyers, and the anti-nuclear people are very, very well funded with very, very strong points of view about things nuclear. In California, they got two laws, uh, got a law passed that prevents the construction of new nuclear plants in the state. I remember that. that if, we're not, if we're ever going to have nuclear power in the state of California, we have to get rid of those laws. And that's what I'm up to right now, is getting those laws, that mm -hmm. law repealed. So my, from about 68 until today, yeah. I have been extremely involved in encountering the anti-nuclear movement, as well as doing my technical work for various com companies. So, and, and you've kept this up, but I, I've read uh, kind of white papers that you've put out on different, on different issues, you mm -hmm. know, opinions you, you've had. And, uh, have you had input into the uh, position papers that the society uh, has been putting out from time to time? Yes. Um, I, I think the linear hypothesis should not be used to extrapolate to reality at low doses. And toward that end, I got the Scientific and Public Issues Committee to write that uh, risk paper that they put out a year or so ago that said below 5 rem you shouldn't calculate risks. Mm -hmm. um, that was partly my, my doing as well as Wade Patterson. Um, I have been, I, I just gave the board a petition at, on Sunday to ask them to do whatever they can do to study the Taiwanese who have been exposed, 10,000 of them, to cobalt-60 radiation for the past 20 years or so in Taiwan because somebody made a mistake and put a cobalt source in a, in a smelter and they made rebar out of it to build apartment houses. And there's some 10,000 Taiwanese who have on the average accumulated over the past 20 years up, up to 600 rem total dose. That's not everybody, but most of them are around 30 or 40. So this is a 10,000 population that we could study to see if there are any beneficial effects from doses like that. So I have, just a few days ago, exercised my gadfly ability and gone to the board of directors and say, please do something to get those people studied so we can find out if there are any beneficial use, uh, effects of, radi of those doses of radiation. Oh, it seems to me that you have on many occasions gone to the board of directors and asked them to look at a problem area. Yes. Probably at least five or ten petitions over 10 or 15 or 20 years. 
And this is something that, that you're still doing, I think. Something it? I'm still doing and I will continue to do. When I see there is a need for them to do something, I will f follow their procedures and see if I can get it done. That's very important. Now, tell me about, about your, uh, you, you've been involved in a lot of standards making. Mm -hmm. and, and you still are. Tell me about the relationship between the Health Physics Society and ASTM. That's a very important relationship. Yeah, there, uh, it started out that, that Health Physics Society Standards Committee was the only organization that was writing voluntary standards in the United States for health physics kinds of things. Um, associated with that is IEEE N42 committee that writes standards that has to do with health physics instruments. Then, um, oh, probably 10 or 15 years ago, ASTM got involved with ASTM E1004 on health physics metrology, how to do mm -hmm. things in health physics. So we now have ASTM, Health Physics Society, um, N42 with IEEE, all writing standards in, this, in the United States that have to do with health physics things. We used to have in ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, a thing called the um, uh, Nuclear Standards Board. And it was supposed to coordinate all nuclear standards yeah. development in the country. That board has gone away now. And it went away because nuclear power went away, and it was mostly concerned with nuclear power standards. It forgot that there was a big part of the nuclear industry mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with n nuclear power plants. So it's gone away. And what we need in this country right now is a coordination function so that we don't have overlaps and conflicts between these three groups and any others that come along in the development of nuclear standards. That doesn't exist at the moment. So I may have to go to the board of directors and ask them to establish it. And, and how, what do you suggest here? In, in other words, this is a real problem, obviously. It, it can be a real <coughs> problem, and it may be that all we need is for the Health Physics Society to establish a memorandum of understanding with other organizations to say, uh, okay, N13 is really the coordinator for uh, radio health physics type standards in the country. Please, everybody, when you're going to develop a standard, tell, the, tell N13 so it can perform this function. I don't know if it would be willing to do that, but it might. So there is a, a way we might be able to get it done. I'll look into that. Well, it sounds like something that's very worthwhile doing, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. Um, what are the, now you've been associated with a lot of standards that have been published over the years. What are the ones that uh, you feel were uh, the most needed standards? That well, there was, there was one we started in 1964 yeah. uh, when I was chair of the Standards Committee of the Southern California Chapter of the Health Physics Society. Uh, Charlie Willis and I were looking at uh, health physics kinds of things and we said, hey, there are, is no national standards for the amount of radioactive material that can be on items released to uncontrolled use. So we said, let's start one. In about two years ago, that standard was finished by Bill Kennedy, who was chair of the working group. And we now have N1312. And in between, there were a lot of chairs of the writing group yeah. for that standard and the problem was the chairs really weren't committed to getting the standard issued in the timeline that they were supposed to. And standards or writing organizations have got to ride herd on their writing groups to make sure they get the standards developed in time. Otherwise, they'll all take 30 years to be developed. And which is terrible. So, so there's that one standard, w which is important, uh, the, the standard on residual radioactivity on items. Mm -hmm. um, what other standards uh, have you worked on over the years? Well, I started the uranium bioassay standard in 1974, which was finished a few years ago, too, not quite as long as the other one. Um, we have started a new standard now. on Who is we? Uh, the N13 and the HPSSC. Mm -hmm. I just wrote the the form that initiates the development of the standard and gave it to them last Sunday on a radiation health standard. 
so that we would have a voluntary standard in the United States for how much dose occupational workers can get for to maintain their radiation health because there's evidence now that the health dose health effects curve is u-shaped and it has an optimum and if you get too much above that you have uh, health problems but also if you get too far below it you have health health problems and we have to have a standard that addresses that that fact and we don't have it at the moment and neither does anybody else so I have started a, a standard to look and see what's the right thing to do so this is um, essentially hormesis you're talking about. No well, matter. the hormetic effect is the thing that makes it right. U-shaped. It makes it U-shaped. Because I know you've been very interested in, in, in hormesis over the years. Yeah. Uh, ever since Lucky published his first book on hormetic effects, quite a few, in 1980, well, before 1986, and we, the Health Physics Society had a whole meeting on hormesis in 86. Yes. It's been apparent to me, at least, <coughs> and to quite a few others, that there's something going on at the low dose region that doesn't follow the li linear hypothesis. And we need to look very carefully at that because we may be causing people harm by reducing their dose. Which is a fascinating thing. It, <laughs> it, it, it's sort of like the homeopathic uh, approach to medicine. In a way, right? mm, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. We're, but it's certainly stimulating uh, uh, um, the immune, immune, immune response. System. Yeah, it certainly flies in the face of the linear hypothesis. Oh, absolutely. But we need to be correct because if we aren't, we're either going to hurt people and or we're going to spend a lot of money for no purpose. So it's a, a subject that everybody sh in the health physics business should be very concerned with and we need to, we need to solve the problem. Now where do you see, um, uh, uh, by the way, um, uh, you are you are now uh, uh, a um, consultant, uh, an advisory scientist uh, kind of thing in, in uh, your work. Well, I have my own company, Nuclear Standards Unlimited. And, 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 you, and, and you're, you're, you're essentially consulting in, in just general health physics areas, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, uh, wh where do you see the standards uh, <coughs> process? that the Health Physics Society has been so intimately involved with, be largely because of, 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 of your efforts, I might add. Where do you see that going? Uh, and and how is it going to get there? Yeah. The, the regulatory agencies, NRC, DOE, EPA, are very concerned about the development of standards, partially because there is a, an, exec a, uh, an OMB circular A119 which directs federal agencies to use voluntary standards where they exist and where they, can where they can apply them. And what the regulatory agencies therefore yeah. want the standards developers to do is to develop the standards they need. They tell us therefore what, what will happen is they will enunciate the needs we, the private sector, will develop the standards, which then the public sector will use. That process is already in place, and as I said, we need the coordination function, which may be uh, belong to N13 for, for health physics standards. Uh, but we need to keep doing what we're doing, and we need to do it on a specific timetable that everyone is committed to. And that's hard to do, to say the least. I'm if you're doing 30 voluntary years is standards, a long time. <laughs> 30 years is an awful long. Well, it's not too long. I well, mean, we've been for around one for standard, 30 years. For one standard. For one standard, it's a long time. Three years is, uh, is reasonable. So uh, in, in these final moments that we have, what advice do you have for the Health Physics Society for being able to accomplish this? It's one thing to say it, it's another to accomplish it. The first thing the society should do and the board of directors should be committed to doing is fully supporting the Health Physics Society Standards Committee in, in the work that it's doing for standards. And when I say fully supporting, I mean, of course, with money, too. But we need to educate the society members on standards, what they do, how you do them, the benefits you as a person get from participating, and that really isn't done very well. How can we do it we better? Need, well, we need more, pay, more information in the newsletter, we need, actually, we need good scientific papers in the journal. 
uh, the the standards committee needs to elevate its its uh, functions by having more uh, papers presented at meetings. Just get the word out to people about standards because they don't know. When I go around as Nuclear Standards Unlimited to companies and say, you can have an input into the development of a standard, they say, oh, we can? How do we do that? Because they know that the regulators are going to come back with that standard someday and impose it on them. And if their point of view isn't incorporated in the standard, they could be hurt. So it's a matter of communication about standards. And of course, communication has uh, perennially been a, a difficult problem with the Health Physics Society and the public. Yeah, we're we're scientists. We're not communicators. <laughs> you know that better Absolutely. Than, than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but but you certainly have been a wonderful communicator and a gadfly. And uh, I'm so glad that we were able to get some of this information down on tape here to uh, talk about your contributions and where you think where you think things are going. And I just want to thank you for uh, giving the History Committee uh, uh, this time. Uh, and hopefully, there'll be other people uh, that will be uh, walking in your large footsteps to move these standards on. And that will continue as I long as we have a profession in a society. I think that will happen. Jack Fi Fix and Joe Ring now are fully committed to the standards development process. And they know what they're doing. And I think it'll work. Well, I want to thank my favorite gadfly for coming and talking to us. <laughs> You're Thanks, welcome. Al. You're welcome. How are we doing time-wise? Good. Okay, you know, what, I, I hope you, we got most...